Welcome to the Strategy Mob Podcast. Tune in for everything you need to know to stay in the know regarding the automotive industry. Here's your host, Jason Harris. Hey, 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 what's going on, Podcast Nation? It is Jason Harris here, and thank you for joining me on another episode of Strategy Mob. Today, I have a be back. That's right, a be back. I have the one, the only, the oh so famous, Mr. Brian Allen in the house. Brian, what's up? <laughs> Uh, you're way, way, way too kind. Careful there. <laughs> well, Brian, I, I'm going to set a big stage here, man, because we have a big topic to talk about today. And, you know, I'm actually, I'll get to be honest with you, I'm excited to talk about this because, you know, so much of the content and so much of the conversation right now has to do with now and rolling closures and inventory levels and stuff like that. And I'm actually kind of glad not to talk about that. So, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, we've jammed about this before. The, the importance of dealers just being, you know, proactive versus reactive. And that's what a lot of this conversation is going to be about today. But before we deep dive right into that, for everybody out there who's watching and listening and, you know, kind of don't know who you are, Brian, and kind of how you got started in the business, I figured we'd kick off today's podcast with a little origin story. So... <laughs> Brian, how did you get started in this crazy little world we call the automotive industry? Well, I'm, I'm probably one of the handful of people that grew up and said, I want to be a car salesman. <laughs> so, yeah. You know, everyone wanted to be a lawyer, doctor, fireman, policeman. But uh, I started trading Hot Wheels, uh, you know, at five and six years old. And I just, I knew I wanted to do something in cars. But uh, so I started selling cars when I was 18 years old. And I was fortunate enough in 1985 to join what became the Galpin Premier Automotive Collection, a division of Galpin Motors. Mm -hmm. And I was there from 85 to 2018, 33 years. And I, I oversaw nine different brands from Aston Martin to Mazda, uh, Subaru, Lincoln, Jag, even uh, Mercury when it was around, <laughs> Volvo, uh, Lotus, and, and multiple points, Subaru. So I, a lot of retail experience. And I, um, I, when I retired, it, it, it was really more that there's so much happening for dealers in the new age of transportation, mm -hmm. the new age trends. I said, I want to go at it at a different angle and help dealers leverage what these new opportunities are going to be. So I, uh, I'm, I'm still a car salesman at heart, <laughs> but I, I, I bring in the tech and, uh, I, I want to make it easier for car dealers to do business by leveraging the infrastructure they already have. And we'll talk more about that. But I, I think it's an amazing time. You know, it really is amazing time. You know, there's like I, our industry has changed more in its approach to communication, to marketing, to the sales process in the last nine months than we probably have in the last 40 years combined. Um, and a lot of that was because our backs were against the wall and we were yeah. forced to do so. But hey, I'll, look, I'll take change any way, any way I can get it. If it's forced change, I'll take it. You know, But I, I still think that there's a lot of change coming. And, you know, today, today we're not necessarily talking about the pandemic, you know, there, there right. are just a lot of fundamental manufacturing and technology changes that are coming in that I, as, as dealers, dealer groups, we need to have these conversations now because yeah. waiting five or seven or six years down the road to have the conversation is just not the right way to do it. So today's topic, EV and autonomous vehicles, I love this topic. You know, when I was at the NADA just before the world shut down, all right, was in Las Vegas and I had a chance to jump in an autonomous taxi. And I got to be mm. honest with you, Brian, it was awesome. It was <laughs> just a super cool experience. And within minutes, I was like, the moment I can buy one or subscribe, Sure. Think, think right. about the productivity. I'll be, right? Oh, my gosh. It was amazing. So, you know, yeah. why don't you let's start with there. Kind of, you know, where do you kind of see the industry at as far as EV and autonomous vehicles, you know, time wise? So, OK, so uh, if you don't mind, I want to just take a couple steps back because sure. I always like to come from a car dealer perspective. Cool. Uh, you know, it's it's 
what I really love, and Bert Bachman is my mentor at Galpin Motors, and frankly, the whole Bachman family, Bo Bachman, Brad Bachman, Brett Bachman, it's just the family's amazing, and the matriarch, Jane Bachman. But what, what Bert really shared with me early, early in my career was that technology and trends are like the ocean and the coast. And that is, the, the coastline may change but it's still going to be the ocean and the coast. <laughs> and in the car business, we may change methods or strategies and opportunities, but it still comes down to people needing transportation and it still is a people business. Now, it, people doesn't mm. necessarily mean face to face. Uh, as we know, online is becoming extremely accepted. And even those that have been had to dragged and pulled to Zoom, if they wanted to see a doctor today, you pretty much got to use some sort of video software. That was it. So, Let's get to the car business. Now, uh, COVID has accelerated the inevitable. Uh, a lot of industry analysis say somewhere between five to 10 years has been accelerated of uh, online digital retail and adoption, uh, service appointments, pretty much every touch point in the car business. The beauty is the car dealers own the infrastructure so they can leverage whatever's going to happen. And this is what a lot of tech companies forget. So mm -hmm. I, I like to talk about food and, and drink because I do enjoy a glass of wine, maybe a martini <laughs> and a nice steak. You uh, know. But you, you think about the, the restaurant, the person who owns a restaurant, if the trends kind of shift away from steak and go to tofu or beyond burger, the restaurateur, all they have to do is change the menu. Exactly. They, right? They own the restaurant. They own the real estate. They've got the kitchen. So as long as they benefit, and, and I wrote an article that was just published by Wards Automotive, and it was basically about Burger King and the, the uh, Impossible Burger. And what some may not realize is that Burger King was one of the few initially that said, hey, let's give this plant-based burger a try. But the backstory is what's really interesting, that the traditional board members of, the, of, of Burger <laughs> yep. King uh, were like, wait a minute, we sell hamburgers, we sell cow, you know. And uh, anyway, the good news is the people went over to said, wait a minute, if there's anybody who can sell plant-based burgers the cheapest, we already have the infrastructure. All we got to do is open the box exactly. and put those bad boys on the grill. Well, Impossible Burgers become somewhere between 30 to 35 percent of Burger King's growth in sales. And Burger King is now uh, producing year over year growth that was that is, <laughs> no pun intended, has previously been impossible in their industry. So similarly, the car business, we have EVs where people saying, oh, dealers are going to be redundant because there's no maintenance, there's no oil changes, there's brake changes like once every 100,000 miles, mm -hmm. uh, and, and people aren't going to need to go to the service department. Well, and there's certainly truth to that. But then they say, oh, and then autonomous cars. Uh, you know, people won't really need to own cars because they can just, like we used to do with horses, whistle, <laughs> and the, exactly. the car comes, but it's a digital whistle through our phone. So guess who's in the best position for all of this? And that's the dealer who already has the infrastructure. Yes. So, you know, today, mobility, dealers can get into the mobility world by starting to prepare their, their fleets. Dealers liquidate aged inventory today. Dealers, uh, now COVID, of course, has created a bit of an inventory shortage, but that's we know true. that all that will end up right-siding itself. Uh, but, but, there's always going to be aged inventory. Well, mm -hmm. imagine today putting on a mobility platform that people can request a car on demand through their smartphone and either have it delivered to them or pick it up at the dealership and rent it for three days to three months subscription, maybe three months to a year. All of these things, instead of wholesaling cars at a loss, instead of taking those write downs, now your aged inventory is a revenue stream. So I'm, I'm senior vice president today of Hire Car, and that's what we help dealers do. Take mm -hmm. their inventory that they, they would otherwise liquidate, and let's learn about mobility because you're going to be the leader. And uh, the dealer, again, I, I like to say they're not going to be a player in the mobility space of EV and autonomous. They own the stadium. 
they, they really they really do own own that stadium, right? And I think what it is is for a lot of dealers out there, there's this there's this element of fear. You know, we were talking a little bit before we before we hit the red button and started recording today. You know, the last ownership model change we had was leasing almost forty years ago, mm, and you know, I, you know we're, we're way overdue for a different model. The consumer is demanding. A, a different model. I mean, it, it, I almost kind of pictured it as kind of like a volcano that, you know, we know erupts every <laughs> 20 or 30 years. And now we're, right. we're 10, 20 years overdue. And just right. everyone's just kind of sitting there staring at it. And I think I feel like I feel I feel like the consumer is staring us at us as an industry and going, all right, what's next? You know, do I do I really have to come in and just do another lease? I'm only on my like, 11th lease now, you yeah. know, like, and do, do I really have to come in and finance something for the end of time and never actually pay it off? And, you know, the never, never, never plan. And I, I think that, you know, EVs, you know, play a big part of that. Autonomous plays even a, a bigger part of that. And look, dealers right now out there that are shaking their heads, you know, for this beginning part of this conversation go, no, we don't really need to do this. Look, manufacturers have already made the moves. Right. I don't think there's a single manufacturer that has not openly come out and made a, a either small or huge commitment to yeah. electric vehicles. And we got to have that discussion. So let's let's do electric vehicles. Then we'll jump over to autonomous real quick. Right. In your thoughts, uh, your opinions, you know, how, how does a dealership prepare themselves for manufacturers uh, making a large commitment to electric vehicles? So the first is really let's look at the dealership's strengths. And mm -hmm. again, the beauty about electric cars is they need charging. <laughs> so exactly. dealers actually, uh, the progressive ones already today, this isn't theory. They're actually making revenue by putting charge points on, on their properties, mm -hmm. superchargers, uh, things that accelerate charging. Because, of course, many customers that will have an electric vehicle will charge at home. But often when you're on the road and suddenly you say, oh, gee, I need, a, I need 15 minutes of a quick charge to get another 100 miles worth of, uh, in essence, fuel, I can just go to my local dealership and, you know, swipe my credit card and, and pay you know, five bucks for 15 minutes of a supercharge or maybe 10 oh, by the way, the dealership was smart enough to put a little bit of a cafe or a restaurant and you create a destination. And Experience. this is where I get so excited is mm -hmm. that dealerships typically, you know, yes, they've been uh, associated with a dental office. Who wants to go get a root canal? <laughs> um, but even my dentist has started pre-COVID uh, making it fun to go to the dentist, a little self-serve cure egg and, and you know, uh, vibrating chairs and all this yeah. stuff. So, but a dealer uh, is only going to have more real estate in the future because as we see this on-demand delivery from the manufacturers where just-in-time arrival of inventory, instead of like Galpin, for example, holding 6,000 cars in stock. It's, it's a huge official, financial demand they're, they're, on dealers, huge financial demand. Right. They're doing the same amount of business today or more pre-COVID business than with 3,000 cars in stock. So they've got mm -hmm. a lot of real estate. So now that real estate can be converted. Imagine, first of all, EV. So instead of making money in oil changes, which actually very few dealers do. That's true. <laughs> uh, you actually make money on your charging stations. And then you make it a nice atmosphere and you put a Starbucks in there. Now, Galpin was the first to have a Starbucks, which I really had a wonderful part in doing. And it, it, it created an atmosphere that instantly disarmed the customer. And they'd walk over and they'd see that Volvo for uh, $299 a month. And they went in for a, a $2.99 Frappuccino. And well, maybe it's $4.99, actually. Well, it's, it's and went out with a, a lease strategy. payment. It's the best retention strategy ever, right? Like, no. um, <laughs> I've, I have a dealer principal. Um, friend of mine, client of mine as well, um, who their their background is actually hospitality. They they, they own a, a, a large amount of restaurants, right? So yeah. when they went and built their they built this big Taj Mahal of a Toyota dealership, that it, it, it was just they didn't even think about it. They didn't even know it was an option. There was no other option that they were just, there was going, they were going to build a restaurant. They were going to build a cafe, right. a proper one with, within the dealership for, for a couple of reasons, a for customer satisfaction, B also staff satisfaction, because there's yes. not a whole lot of places they can, they can do that. But, but right. I agree with you though. Like, you know, I think as an industry, you know, with service intervals getting 
longer and longer and longer and longer. You know, instead of seeing customers four times a year, you know, you're seeing them two times a year, depending on your manufacturer. Lucky Once for a that. year, right? Yeah. Like we, this we is really this solves the entire problem. An oil change. <laughs> I, I I can see the customer weekly in this particular case, right? Mm -hmm. And talk about building some serious relationships and that retention model. I mean, cause look, we, we all sit around and do it. Like as, as an industry, industry, we sit around and just spend hours and days and, and months developing a monster retention strategies right. when this vehicle, this tech has it built into it. Yeah. Don't you agree? And so, and think about, you know, the more a customer visits the dealership and enjoys the environment, mm -hmm. they're going to see things and tell their friends and think of the referral business. And, oh, yeah, and you exactly. know, Cox did a study like three years ago that said 33% of consumers would buy cars more frequently if they enjoyed the experience. So just imagine the upside opportunity that dealers have if people found it more convenient. You know, I, in my neighborhood, I've got people that could afford to buy 16 Mercedes if they want to. Sure. And, and they've got a five year, uh, a five to 15 year old, 20 year old luxury car that they don't change just because they don't enjoy the experience. So huge upside. And, um, and, and the EV is just the beginning mm -hmm. of it because on demand transportation is growing. And here we talk about the here and the now, because, you know, we have to eat today as well as plan for the harvest tomorrow. That's so, that's so true. Even though I, I find dealerships don't do enough of that, right? right like right. we're so stuck in that 30 day cycle. And I think yes. that's, you know, it, look, if, if you're watching or listening right now, this is what this whole podcast is about is we want you to start having, you need to have these conversations because no matter what you think or feel, <laughs> right? Bottom line is, the entire industry and the client is moving that direction. But sorry, yes. sorry to interrupt, but continue. No, but to your point is that you, this isn't about if, it's truly about when. Exactly. And, and now, frankly, as I said, COVID has accelerated a lot of things. First of all, human nature has to change. You know, I, I love the story about the ATMs. ATMs came out in the late 60s, early 70s. Mm -hmm. It took 20 years for human beings to get past the point of trusting a machine to take a paycheck or, you know, <laughs> uh, put cash in and not get a stamped book by the teller. Yep. Uh, it, it, it took that long. And, and even then, the benefit of ATMs, bank branches didn't close. Uh, forget about COVID for a second. There, there are more bank branches around than ever. So you have you have both happening, the ATM for convenience, but people still go in the bank, which is, it blows my mind. I, I don't know the last time I've been in a bank. I was just thinking about um, that. I don't remember. Well, <laughs> well remember, what, what are banks doing now? They're selling insurance, mm -hmm. stocks. Uh, they're, they're doing money management. So uh, they're really working for uh, credit lines, mortgages. So it's kind of like the dealer. Other revenue streams are what banks are working uh, to, to do. And that's what they do. You've got a client manager. You know, you, mm -hmm. you put a couple thousand dollars in the bank and suddenly you have a private client wealth management. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it's, this is really where I see the dealership space uh, being able to leverage this new technology. Now, here's the best part. Billionaires, well, I should say billion-dollar companies, are investing a lot of money in tech to disrupt the automotive dealer. And what now they're finding, and this is going on the past year, actually they need to partner with the dealer to leverage this technology. Yep. And I, I talk about drinking and, and wine and stuff. You could have the most amazing tequila George Clooney figured this out quickly, but yeah. until you find a distributor, you can't sell your tequila. Dealers are the distributor. Yes. And that of the technology that is wasted, I shouldn't say wasted, the billions of dollars are wasted to get it right. And so dealers have to operate on a cash flow positive basis. So what I like is the smart dealers stand back and, and they let Silicon Valley figure it out and get, you know, $10 billion from Wall Street. <laughs> yep. And then when they get it figured out, then the dealer says, okay, uh, I'll participate. And you can put this through my dealership. Of course, I don't want to pay for it uh, because you're going to be able to leverage this to a lot of other dealers and go to OEMs. So the, the dealers win. They, they end up not being the dinosaur, 
by any stretch, no. but being this wholly new creature that helps actually accelerate the things that the technology company thought they were going to do, the dealer ends up doing it. Boy, you know, that really does kind of require a, 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 a mind shift. Yes. You know, like the, the way that we approach the customer, you have to understand that the way we've always approached the customer is that we get one shot. That's it. Right. They come through our Very door. Very unforgiving. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Like it's in, so, well, this kind of changes that, you know, this doesn't give us, you know, one shot anymore. We don't, we don't, we can see customers that have bought electric vehicles from many other places and encourage them to charge with us and in, in sure. any way or possible and get now an opportunity. It's, it's, it's like a, a pre-built way to acquire new business into, into it. But, but to your point, you hit it earlier is it's experience. Like, See, there's, we, we really need to understand, you know, what it means to give an experience. And, and I always struggle with that because everybody knows what a good experience is. Like, it's not, this isn't rocket science, you know, like everybody's been to a, a great resort. Everybody's been to an awesome restaurant. They, they've had great experiences. For some reason, they can't seem to wrap their heads around or maybe unwilling to invest in that great experience in the dealership, you know. Uh, just kind of your opinion, how do we get dealers to get into that mindset of, you know, both embracing EV, but embracing the experience that comes along with EV? So the way to do it is, is really what kind of we're doing at Hire Car, and that is engaging with OEMs and dealers to be able to tiptoe into it. For example, we have dealers that put cars on our platform. And just a, a short story without sounding like a commercial, <laughs> what we do is we connect vehicle drivers, people who want to drive a car for gigs. So that's Uber, Lyft, food or package delivery. Mm -hmm. And you can imagine that skyrocket. And they want to rent cars initially, and most likely they'll eventually buy one. So we, we have a dealer say, hey, you know what? Give us four or five cars that you are going to wholesale anyway. And let's put them on the platform and we'll connect the drivers and we do the insurance and, and it's all amazing technology through the smartphone. The dealer doesn't have to worry about administration other than handing the keys to the person who comes to the store. Not much different than a traditional rental or loaner car. Mm -hmm. And even that's changing because we're working with keyless uh, technology where the dealer doesn't even have to do that. But so the dealer can tiptoe into this, getting used to a customer inquiring to reserve a vehicle from two days to six months. And the, the beauty is that all the dealer has to do is have that car ready. And yes, you're similar. You mentioned leasing, which is such a beautiful analogy in that leasing was a paradigm shift as well for dealers. Cause it's like, I like to sell cars. Uh, I'll wholesale <laughs> yep. a car to executive leasing or Southwest less leasing and let them deal with the customer. And then the manufacturer and the dealer woke up and said, wait a minute, the dealer's closest to the customer. Why would we let them go to another source for an alternative way to consume transportation? For sure. So your point is dead on. This is an alternative way that dealers can get their toe, toes dipped in the water and start and say, wow, I see these people more often. Yep. And we build a, an experience. And it leads naturally into autonomous because dealers, my vision that, you know, some thought it was 10 years out now. I think we're closer to 2024, 20, 2025. 20, mm -hmm. Dealers will have little fleets of, of um, autonomous vehicles because they're closest to the customer again and, and they're closest to their, their immediate geographic circle. And someone will just basically call for a, uh, you know, a, maybe a Ford Escape to autonomously drive to them to have for the weekend. And because they're working from home, because our, you know, a lot of work paradigms are going to shift permanently because of COVID, they don't need a car Monday through Friday, but they want it maybe, or maybe Friday night through Sunday. And, and I so think that's so important. So like the dealer so, wins. That's right. See, that's what this whole, this whole thing about. So we're trying to drive home the dealer wins here, right? Yeah. I think there's still the kind of this, this, this fear with autonomous vehicles that the autonomous vehicle is going to put them out of, out of business. But again, you know, autonomous vehicles need a central hub. Like they, they have to go back somewhere. They, 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 oh. they, they need to be charged or yes. they, they need to be serviced. They need to be cleaned. Yep. They need to be sanitized, right? They, 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 they're a fleet that still has to be managed and still has to be handled. Right. And yeah, guess what? Dealers got a lot of space and building yeah, and, and you infrastructure know, I, I to make, handle sure all of this. Private ownership is going to be around 
for a long time. And for actually, sure. my ideal, I'm looking to have a privately owned autonomous car, right? I'm with it's, you. Me too. It's, we've gone full circle. It's basically like the horse. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, it, that's what's really going to be fun. If, there are times where I want to drive, it's times I don't. And so th- there's just always to win. But what I do know, you touched on it earlier, subscription is another thing. And that's where people don't want to make a three-year commitment, especially as technology is changing. Uh, I know that initially when they came out with being able to buy a smartphone with a monthly payment, everyone said, oh, you're going to have a monthly payment for life. Mm -hmm. Well, in reality, we do have monthly payments for life on almost everything. It's just we either prepay for it (laughs) or we pay over a month's term. But with technology, the obsolescence factor is a killer. You know, it's it's not like real estate um, where you'd like to enjoy paid off real estate. With a car, as we know, these things are upgrading constantly. Exactly. And like, why I, do I want to own one? Right. Like, you know, right. I, I already am kind of annoyed that I own a car. I'm like, you know <laughs> what? I'm like, you know, well, I put a lot of mileage on a car anyways. But, you know, I'm, I'm, oh, I'm two and a half years into this car I have right now. I have a hundred and... 80, 180, 90,000 kilometers I've put on it. I'm like, I don't want this thing anymore. Well, but you know what's funny? You just mentioned about mileage. So <laughs> EVs really turn that on its head too. It does, doesn't You know, it? today you have some EV uh, warranties that are not based on mileage. They're based on years. Uh, some cars are 10-year warranty that it really covers everything. Yes. And it doesn't matter what the miles are. It, 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 it really doesn't. So that's probably another reason why I'm excited about EV vehicles because, yeah. you know, look, I do an oil change every single month. You know, I just wow. had I just had one of my employees, they were complaining they had to do a brake job and it cost them oh. $900 for a brake job. And I said, well, when was the last time you did one? They're like three years ago. I'm like, <laughs> I, I, I do it yearly, if not sometimes twice. You know? <laughs> like, right. But, but I think that's the case is that we have to start thinking of our dealerships and to your point, they're almost all structured in a way that it doesn't take a whole hell of a lot to change right. them. But we can start no. doing this now by focusing on what that user experience, what that customer experience is going to be. You know, um, remove the desk, replace them with lounges. You know, like I was, I was thinking the other day, I, I was in a meeting with a big group and, and someone asked the question. I love the, the way they asked the question. Why, why should someone want to service with us? Want versus need. That's a good question. All right. Why would they actually want to? What do you provide, you know, operationally different than everybody else that would actually make them want to service with you? And I said, well, think about things that you want to do yourselves. You know, like, you know, when I, when I got on an airplane, I want to be in business class. Mm-hmm. I do. Doesn't necessarily mean I am, but you know, like, I, I want to, but I want that type of experience. You know, c- could I not just show up to get my vehicle service and I can sit down in kind of a my own kind of little little pod and, you know, and just have that type of experience. Like there's just, I think that's what everyone, everyone's got to start asking themselves how to create that experience. But I think a lot of people are are lost on how you start the conversation. How would you recommend people? Remove the desk. You know, it's so funny when we put the Starbucks in at Galpin, uh, you know, Bert Bachman was very concerned that we wouldn't have enough customer parking for our people who wanted to buy cars <laughs> because of Starbucks and Starbucks. And what we found, the Starbucks customers came really early in the morning before car buyers did. I mean, I'm talking six to nine o'clock, sure. right? So fortunately, the pattern of traffic was opposite of, of our retail automotive traffic. And then of course the service customers were over the moon, but here was a big benefit. And this ties into EVs here. So there Mm -hmm. is, there is connection here. Uh, The customer who wanted a loaner car said, you know what, if you can change my oil in a couple hours, I'm okay. You got the Starbucks here and you've got free Wi-Fi." So not only were they enjoying the experience, but they, we didn't have to pay for a rental car or a loaner car. They're looking forward and to it. Was, and then meantime, we're, we're earning 20 bucks in the Starbucks because they had a $5 <laughs> coffee and, and several muffins or something. That's and great. they were happy. So the EVs are going to accelerate that. Mm-hmm. Remove the desks. And you have dealerships today that are handing customers iPads when they walk in the showroom floor. Sure. And they go, listen, um, you know, I just want to share our experience. I'm going to hand you an iPad and, and you're going to start the process and I'm here with you to guide you through it. And you let them know you're not going to meet Guido 
<laughs> you know, you're not going to meet a uh, senior finance person who's going to, you know, try and uh, share other products with you. And, and you, you, I'm the one and you and me, we're going to make this happen together. And by the way, if you don't buy today, that's OK. Hopefully I can earn your business in the future. But you're going to leave here very well informed. You know, and oh, that's, that's awesome. the beauty of the progressive dealer today. It, you know what it is and progressive dealer. Right. That's that's what we're talking about. Right. We're in. Right. I, I think we're, we're gently pushing people to be progressive, you know, yes. and, and look, some of the people listening, watching may say, Hey man, I'm already on this. And that's great. Thanks. Uh, you know, but like, we're not telling you, you need to go remodel your dealership right this second. That, okay. We're, we're not telling you that you need to go install, you know, 30, you know, fast chargers at a cost of $1.2 million. Right. right. Like, uh, well, I don't know, maybe, but, um, <laughs> but bottom line is we have to have this quite, we have to have this conversation because we need to be prepared. So, you know, uh, for the dealers out there that are listening right now or watching Brian and going, okay, let, I'll have the conversation, right? What are the two or three things that I need to have the conversation about right now so that I am prepared for EVs and then soon after that autonomous vehicles? So uh, a, a couple of really great things. When a dealership gets an EV structure in their store, charging station. And it doesn't matter if you don't sell them yet either. Mm -hmm. uh, that, that's a lot of dealers are waiting till the manufacturer says, you must put these in. Be, get ahead of the curve because you're going to draw customers that are incremental. And there's another thing, dealers respect, or excuse me, the customer will respect you because you're respecting the change and you're seen not as the typical dealer, you're seen as the progressive, wow, these, this company is with it and they care about me so that when they are ready to get an EV to trade in maybe the one they're driving already, you're going to be that source. You're, you're going to be the go-to. So right now today, first thing is look at what your options are to put some EV stations in. Second, what you said, Jason, Remove the desks. Mm -hmm. You know, dealerships a little while ago started removing cars. The showrooms were always full of cars. Yep. And they, they started putting like customer tall belly up tables with computers or today it's mostly laptops or tablets. But it's make it when you walk in that it doesn't look like they're there to take your money. You're there to have a good time. Yes. Dealers can do that now. It's actually make it look like you're a car show. Not a dealership, but that once a year car show. I can't wait for those to come back, by no the way. Kidding, me too. Uh, but uh, that, that's, that was, frankly, again, I, I know I say Bert Bachman's name a lot, but he, was, he always wanted his dealership to be a destination to enjoy cars. And, and then you would end up buying one by default. And that mindset just stayed burned in my brain for all processes. So dealers then also... Start looking at uh, companies. Of course, I'm going to say hire a car, but there, there's a few companies out there that can help you. Cox Automotive, Clutch Technologies, mm -hmm. another one to help dealers get into the mobility business. And it's uh, the telematics are an important part of it. You want to know where your cars are. It takes away a lot of administration nightmare. It automates things. But uh, Clutch has a lot of great dealer-focused software to manage fleets that are rented to customers. And they would off, we say on-demand, it's really just rental. But <laughs> subscription is also rental. It's just a longer term. Uh, but renting used cars is an extremely profitable option for dealers that gets them into mobility and, and start to see a different customer, but an incremental customer. And that's, a great that, to that's how they can start today. So, I, I think it's a great way to kind of prepare, prepare yourselves. Cause like we yes. said it earlier, right? This is a, not a, this is not a, if it's going to come, it's, it's just simply a matter of, of when it's going to come. And, yes. you know, I think that's the dealers that are going to be prepared for it. Look, look, I, it's actually kind of a cool time right now because I'm having dealerships have conversations around their identities in the first place. Right. Yeah. You know, for example, I have a handful of Ford dealerships that don't have trucks. You know, these are dealerships that are literally 60 to 75% of their business is trucks. So yeah, they're, they're, all, they're, they're forced to have this conversation of, all right, well, what if we're no longer a truck dealership and we have to operate as a small SUV, you know, dealership for the next 
nine mm-hmm. months until we get a regular flow of inventory. And that's why I think it's a great time to have this conversation because you're already having these conversations. You're already trying to prepare for what that next identity is going to look like. And it, it, that's, it's, we, we got to have those. And those are some great starting points. Um, Brian, I, th- I think kind of my, my, my last one is, you know, once we're kind of prepared, you know, you, I loved how you said earlier, kind of that stadium, right? Like, like how do we own that stadium though? Um, so, because like, I think there's well, the, that is the confusing dealer, for others. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. So they, it's certainly from experience. Again, I'm not speaking as a consultant. I was there. Uh, the person who owns the land owns the hand. I like that. And and most dealers, uh, one of their sources of income is rent to themselves because they own the land. So. As the use of the land changes, kind of going back to that restaurant that they're a steakhouse, but they also sell plant-based, you know, uh, meat. Sure. Uh, the dealer can easily pivot to anything in the transportation industry and do it without additional capital investment. See, all these companies out there in Silicon Valley that say, oh, you can buy a car for me and not go to the dealer. We'll ship it to you on a truck. All that. They have to create a whole new brand. Mm -hmm. They have to create an infrastructure somehow, but the dealer already owns it. So if the dealer takes that technology and allows someone to buy a car through a phone or rent a car through a phone, the dealer, they, they pay $99 a month for software. (laughs) Exactly. <laughs> they own the most expensive part. They, the people are already there. The salesperson becomes a mobility consultant, not just a salesperson. The service department becomes an EV charging center, not just an oil change place. Yep. And there was no additional invo- uh, expense by the dealer. Yes, maybe some investment in EV stations. But what I promise you is the EV stations are cheaper than a dealer's advertising budget on a monthly basis. Well, I think that's a and, great point. You know, that, that, no, seriously, you're, that's you're a really, dollars. really good point. Because, you know, um, I actually had a conversation. My operations manager was actually surprised when this came out of my mouth with one of our largest clients was, is actually, you know what? I actually don't want you to spend as much in marketing this year. And then my, my, what the, what are you talking <laughs> about? We didn't have this discussion. And, but I did, I was encouraging them to say, I want to, I want you to invest more money into what the experience at the dealership is. And if that means getting rid of the desk, you get rid of the desk. If that means increasing your, fur, uh, getting new furniture, you get new furniture. If you, if you get rid of that, that, that piece of crap, 50 inch TV that you bought 10 years ago <laughs> that the blue doesn't even work. So it's just kind of like this faded green color, like what, whatever it is, right? Like that, that, that's, that's the starting point of kind of owning that stadium. And I think that's what it is. I think I, look at the bottom line is if, if, if you don't do it, your manufacturer is going to do it for you of owning your yeah. stadium, right? We're, you know, you're, you're familiar with a program called Kinto, you know, by, by Toyota, right? Where, yeah. you know, Toyota is already installing the technology at the manufacturing level within the vehicles so that the vehicle can be remotely rented that's and right. started, you know, right here and, Last year, Toyota did it with all their hybrid models. Uh, from my understanding, I guess all new 2021 Toyotas will have this tech built into it. But if don't, don't be left behind because Correct. the manufacturers are already going to start focusing on how they can own the stadium and the dealerships need to really own the stadium. I, I'm curious to get your thoughts on manufacturers. I guess I don't want to say stepping on dealers' toes, but it could look like that. What do you think? Well, you know, the manufacturers are in a tough spot. And, and I, I really can argue this one both ways. The manufacturer has to bring a lot of dealers forward with the thoughts we're talking about today. So what happens is, is it the carrot or the stick? So they'll typically tie margin to operational initiatives, right? Mm-hmm. The facilities improvements, you have to have purple chairs instead of red chairs, all that sort of stuff. Yeah. So the manufacturer does have leveraging tools for the dealer that doesn't jump on board with what the manufacturer wants done. So I understand that because they've, they've got to move the whole uh, experience because let's just take a manufacturer like Audi, um, a, a wonderful brand. But, you know, they've put a lot of, of challenges to dealers on facilities and constantly improving them. And almost every five years, they change something. Um, but Audis are, have done, Audis done really well. Mm-hmm. And it's, 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 a, 
opportunity for the dealers that got ahead of it so that they, they weren't the last ones to the party. They got to enjoy the differentiation early. So today, before, as you wisely said, Jason, before the manufacturer demands some of these things, let the dealer have their own branded app. Because like you say about Kinto Share and Toyota, that's branded by the manufacturer. Exactly. The dealer just becomes a facilitator. Mm -hmm. Let the dealer own the app and the process and do it. And then it is the, the customer re retains is, is more respectful of the dealer versus this is a program by Ford or Toyota. Uh, so, the, you know, I, I, I've never that's had where an my heart comes from initiative where I felt enjoyed being the facilitator of that initiative. Do you know right. what I mean? Like that has never been, you know, like I remember, you know, my OEM saying, Hey, look, we have a bunch of enterprise deals and we need you to facilitate that. And I never enjoyed that. And I, and I think that's what it is. Like dealers, like don't get to that place. Don't let, don't let yourself get to that place where, you know, your, your manufacturer will facilitate <laughs> your growth versus you actually owning and moving that growth along. Um, Brian, I, I know it's getting towards kind of the tail end of our time, but I, I do want to talk a little bit before we go about kind of the impact on the operations. And I'm going to take this more towards uh, the direction of the staff, because I think EV vehicles and autonomous vehicles changes the way the staff looks right yeah. now in a big way. And I'd love to get your thoughts on that. So, uh, first of all, you're absolutely correct. The, the issue, which is a positive one, mm -hmm. is that there's a lot of people in the workforce that would want to work at a dealership because they like cars, mm -hmm. but they don't because they don't like conflict of traditional negotiating or anything that would appear to be confrontational. The, there's going to be, there are today because of COVID, more unemployment than probably since the depression. Yeah. So a dealer could never be in a better position to hire more socially aware employees that have compassion for a customer and want to be consultive versus argumentative or confrontational. Sure. Now, look, this, this isn't something new. Most people don't want to be in a business that's confrontational with a customer or could have any unpleasantness. <laughs> but <true>. this <laughs> shift that COVID is, is accelerated to a consultive manner of selling uh, is, is a perfect opportunity to either take your current employees and help them transfer their skills uh, or take people who would never consider being a, quote, car salesman and letting them be a mobility consultant. Yes. And that, that's, that's the business, biggest opportunity. So either way, it's a win. You take your current people and say, hey, here's where we're moving. And how many people want to get on this bus? Uh, because we've got a lot of people that are going to want to get on the bus if you don't want to uh, come to our new destination. we got plenty of people that will. And uh, it, it's, it's a beautiful thing for everybody that's in the business today and people who would like to be in the business but want, don't want that back and forth nightmare that's been the the butt of most stand-up comedians of how to how buy a car in the old days. That's true. That's true. Right. Hey, look, you know, look, when I had my Mitsubishi dealership, I had the same thing. You know, uh, I stopped hiring salespeople and I started hiring product specialists. And I'll tell you, it was crazy. I remember putting an ad out for salespeople and mm -hmm. like, I, I remember my manager coming to me because there's just, there's none out there. Well, there's no good ones at least. And the ones that are have really bad habits or want you know, obscene amount of money. I said, well, okay, fine. I want you to run the same ad, but I want you to change the title to product specialist. And I want to mm -hmm. see what happens. It's the only thing I want you to change. It's just that I'm just out of curiosity. All and right. we went from, you know, one week having like 20 applicants to having over 116 applicants in three days for a product specialist. And the, the just the, the, the sheer, I guess, um, want to be that individual, to be that that, that expert of technology and expert of product, there, there was this level of kind of pride and people were like, yeah, I want to be, I want to be that person. I want to yeah. be, you know, and I think about it back when, you know, one of the first jobs I ever had before I got into car sales was I worked at Radio Shack. Radio Shack oh, still around. One of my favorite. I could get lost in there like a library. <laughs> you know, like I, I loved it. 
you know, but, but this was back in the day that if you had questions, we had answers. That was yeah. their motto, right? And you can have a question about anything, a diode, a resistor, uh, radio wave frequencies. Like you, you just had to be prepared for everything. And so if you worked at a Radio Shack, like it was a thing. It was like, you must know stuff to work Oh, yeah. There. And now, of course, over the years, unfortunately, the brand changed and that whole model just disappeared, right. right? But I feel like that's where we can get back to where it's like we can build brands and businesses around you have questions, we have answers, yeah. you know, and that's all the people that are employed. Now, when you are ready to do the transaction, we have transactional people that will, that will you know, handle the transaction in the lowest amount of pressure humanly possible, you know, but it's that product specialist, man. I think that's there's such huge, huge opportunity there. Um, how do you think a dealership can start um, employing and looking for that type of talent right now? Well, the first thing is, is you change the environment, right? Mm -hmm. So you, I, I just love it. I'm going to steal it from you, Jason, where you said, remove the desks. <laughs> you know, this, this desk environment, if somebody walked into the showroom and saw the belly up tables and a cafe and maybe some sofas, that that instantly sets the stage for sure and like you said just a title change is is critical but that's what you do you you create the environment that's going to be appropriate for the person that that works there and you know it's like the tower right you walk into a dealership yeah. and you see some big three foot elevated tower where where the salesperson has to look up and it's almost it's it's crazy when i walk into stores and i still see that today um, that's got to go. Oh, for absolutely sure. has to go. That's, oh, well, no, no, I agree. It. You know what it is, is, um, I feel like there's a lot of dealerships out there that have been hiring for product specialists and they've been employing them, but they haven't gone as far as creating the environment that feels Correct. like, you know, like I, I was at a dealership the other day, new client, we're pitching, you know, a decent dealer group, 12, 13 dealerships, right? And um, I enter, someone comes to introduce themselves. They introduce themselves as a product specialist. But then to your point, I'm looking around. There ain't nothing different here. All I'm seeing yeah, is still a desk. I'm still that. seeing a tower. I'm still seeing, like, the environment doesn't necessarily match what this person's job title is. So I, I, I think I think that, that is a big thing. We actually have to change the environment and the cool thing is you don't do it your manufacturer will because i've seen some of these new layouts for these dealerships yeah. and you know we're getting closer and closer to the point where offices are gone desks are gone you know i i'm calling them payment lounges yeah. um, finance lounges where you can actually uh, you know sit in i think about it when, when i used to go to my, my my finance guy you know it was we sat at a desk now i go and you know he's like no no come over here he's got two couches we sit at the couch and we just have a casual conversation. It's just, yeah. you know, and it's just like, that's where I see that we have to kind of go is to uh, this more comfortable lounge type formats. We're just like, no, we just kind of come in. We'll, we'll have a conversation about it. I'm excited well, about that. You? You're, so, you're so ahead of it, Jason, because when we put the Starbucks in at Galpin, and this was 2002. That's awesome. Uh, the customer would say, well, can, can we sit over there to complete the deal? And actually, <laughs> Starbucks had a provision that you couldn't negotiate anything about buying a car in the Starbucks Starbucks area, and I understood their their reasoning. They didn't, you know, they, they didn't want to grind people. They wanted to grind coffee. <laughs> so, <laughs> I like that. So, so yeah, they, they wanted that to be a safe zone. But what we did is that we emulated the Starbucks furniture throughout other parts of the dealership uh -huh. to have that comfort zone. Yes, comfort exactly zone. to your point. Well, you know what it, it, it is. I think it's time. You know, we look, we've changed titles, we've changed kind of some operations. It's time to start changing the actual environment. Um, Brian, I know it's the, the end of our time today, and I'm confident we could probably go a lot longer. But before I let you go, for everyone out there that's watching and listening right now, we'd love to connect with you, learn more about Hire Car, learn more about kind of what, what you do and your role. What is the best way to connect with you? It's pretty simple, Brian, B-R-I-A-N, at HireCar.com. And, of course, we wouldn't be a tech company if we didn't misspell it. So it's H-Y-R-E-C-A-R.com. Or you just Google me. You'll see me on probably America's Most Wanted or something like that. But Brian Allen, B-R-I-A-N-A-L-L-A-N. And I'd love to chat with anybody out there about different opportunities or just, you know, uh, share what they can do in their area and, and who would be best to help them. That's awesome. I, I love how just easy you are to approach and just have conversations. It says, it says so much about you as an individual. Um, oh. Brian, thank you again for 
being a be back today and right. jamming with me. Uh, this was a lot of fun. I'm sure we'll be doing it again soon. You have yourself an amazing day. Thank you. Merry Christmas and happy everything. Thanks, you too. Thanks for tuning in to the Strategy Mob Podcast with your host, Jason Harris. Don't want to miss new content? Be sure to sign up to be a mobster at strategymob.com to stay in the know. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe.